So good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to the second session of a cycle of free uh, webinars going online every Tuesday uh, of July and within the scope of the Postgraduate Diploma Creative Research, Arts, Health and Technology at the University Fernando Pessoa in uh, Porto, Portugal. Uh, I'm Diogo Marques. Uh, last Tuesday, I had the opportunity of having here with me two very special guests, uh, researcher and artist Pedro Veiga from the Open University of Lisbon and uh, Rui Torres, a poet, a researcher and a teacher at the University Fernando Pessoa. And during that session, Pedro and uh, Rui uh, shared with us their artworks in digital media and cyber literature, respectively relating their creative research to the theme of that session, Artivism, Public Health and uh, Environments. Uh, for those of you who are not able to participate, I will leave, I left the, the link to access the recorded session in the sessions, in this session's uh, chat. And um, today we will be talking about creative research in graphic medicine, a topic that it is not entirely, dis entirely disconnected from last session's uh, thematic, uh, but one that has specificities of its own. And in order to discuss the potentials and eventual pitfalls of graphic medicine, I will have here with me three very special guests that I will start by introducing without further delay. Susana de Noronha, Steph Lenk and Assunta Aligiani. Uh, welcome and thank you very much for accepting my invitation uh, to be here uh, today. Uh, Susana de Noronha, an anthropologist, PhD in sociology, and a researcher at the Center for Social Studies, University of Coimbra, Portugal. Uh, Susana is also the author of three books resulting from our research on artistic representations of cancer, uh, A Tinta, a Mariposa e a Metástase, a Arte como Experiência, Conhecimento e Ação sobre o Câncer de Mama, uh, I will say it in English, more or less, Art has experienced knowledge and action on breast cancer, uh, published in 2009. Objetos feitos de cancro, mulheres, cultura material e doenças nas histórias da arte, objects made of cancer, women, material culture and diseases in art stories from 2015. And most recently in 2019, Cancro sobre papel, histórias de oito mulheres portuguesas entre a palavra falada, arte e ciência escrita. Cancer on paper, stories of eight Portuguese women between spoken word, art and written science. Uh, in addition to being a writer and researcher, Susana is also a published lyricist and author of scientific illustrations using photography, painting and creative ethnographic drawing. Our second guest, Steph Lenk, assistant, assistant researcher with the Pathographics Project at the Free University of Berlin. Steph has worked in the comics and publishing industry for over 10 years and is interested in the practical application of academic research into graphic novels and illness narratives. She has a master's degree in medical art from the University of Dundee and in 2018, she designed and co-curated the international exhibition Sick, Reclaiming Illness in Comics, held at the Berlin Museum of Medical History. She maintains a personal art practice, including predominantly wordless graphic narratives, and her work can be found at stephlenk.com. And last but not least, our third guest, also affiliated with the Free University of Berlin, specifically working with the Applied Literary Studies project, uh, Assunta Aligiani, currently writing her master's uh, thesis focusing on the representation of autism spectrum disorder in educational and autobiographical comics, and currently developing an autobiographical comic about her mother's diagnosis with Asperger syndrome and their relationship. So once again, Susanna, Steph, Asunta, thank you all for being here today. So 
as we can see, each one of our guests deals with a specific theme or a sub theme, although it is possible to place uh, their creative research work under uh, the large banner of uh, graphic medicine. However, uh, this diversity, a characteristic that seems to enrich the field of graphic medicine, is also what makes of it, I believe, a very complex notion. Uh, we are not ignoring, of course, the genesis of the, the term, specifically within the context of medical humanities, more or less, say, decades uh, ago. Um, uh, but we will be dealing here today with a broader definition of uh, graphic medicine since the goal of this webinar is not so much to bring more clarity to the term and field of graphic and medicine, uh, but rather to introduce practice-based uh, research uh, within the field uh, to a wider audience. Now, I will interrupt briefly to ask our participants to shut down their microphones if possible, since we are having some interferences. Okay, thank you very much. So often described as the interaction between the medium of comics and the discourse of uh, healthcare, uh, like narrative medicine, uh, graphic medicine plays a valuable role in the way certain cultural perception about health, health problems are conveyed and can be changed or subject, subject to this demystification. Uh, but also in changing the ways in which we exp the experience between patient, uh, carer, provider is processed, playing a tremendous role in the way uh, difficult subjects are communicated. Uh, also known as graphic pathographies, among other possible uh, designations, graphic medicine can also be succinctly described as illness narratives in graphic form. Moreover, the fact of being born from the cross-fertilization of sev several different fields of knowledge makes of this particular uh, field one with an impact in apparently non-related issues, such as ecology and climate changes, gender and sexual identity, politics, among others. Uh, these will serve as the main pillars of our conversation here today, as I'm eager to learn more from our three guests and their interdisciplinary takes on these uh, subjects, namely having in mind that Susanna, Steph and Asunta share the same um, predisposition towards practice-based research, even research-based practice. Uh, and the like, a reason why I previously told them to feel free to share uh, their artistic work with us, either by sharing their screens on, or by indicating uh, links. Um, so I was, I was previously saying, and my most sincere apologies for this long introduction, that graphic medicine plays a valuable role in the relationship between all of those involved in healthcare. Uh, secondly, uh, regarding universities, uh, it is also known that comics and graphic novels are starting to be suggested by teachers to their students. And it is a discussion that also relates with the way universities are changing the way graphic fiction is seen inside universities' corridors uh, and classrooms. However, we cannot ignore that uh, its interdisciplinary nature, nature is often ahead of the ways in which universities' curricula and syllabi are uh, structured, often in very closed compartments. Uh, and all of this becomes much more complicated when it comes to practice-based research. Uh, taking into account all of these complex relationships, I would like to start uh, by asking Susanna, how do you place your practice-based research in the context of this interdisciplinary and sometimes transdisciplinarity, uh, namely taking your, into account your background as an anthropologist and specifically regarding your research on graphic representations of cancer? Uh, does it facilitate practice-based research being an, an interdisciplinary field? Well, first, Diogo, I would like to thank you and Fernando Pessoa University for your generous invitation and to greet not only the audience, but to greet my fellow colleagues, Steph and Assunta. I will share my screen because I think it's easier to sh share some results and to see what, uh, what I mean with my presentation. So let's see if I can do it. So I hope you're seeing what I'm seeing. <laughs> 
Diog, is everything okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. We can see your, so, your yeah, yeah. Your okay, in my case, what facilitated practice-based research or what we would call a hands-on interdisciplinarity was my own background or biography. I was an art student uh, during my high school years, committed to the study of the arts and material culture during my bachelor or what we call licentiate degree in anthropology. And I was also a lyricist outside academia. So all of that converged to the development and use of a new methodology in my work as a researcher between my master, my PhD and my postdoc. So I'm merging three fields, anthropology of art, material culture studies and medical anthropology using simplified writing and creative ethnographic drawing within my social science projects. And above all, doing a type of science that carries the ambition of having a transformative effect at the social level, being also driven by a family experience of cancer, the sarcoma and amputation of my mother's left arm. But I would also say that your research center, the freedom it gives you to pursue transdisciplinary, activist or hybrid research agendas is equally important. Not only that, but funding agencies, because I had the support of the Portuguese Foundation for Science and Technology with three consecutive grants. So they allowed me this kind of hybrid research. So explaining a little bit of my work, um, during the last 15 years, my interlocutors have always been female cancer patients and survivors, first analyzing and then from theory to practice, helping to shape illness narratives in the visual and plastic arts. As an example, I can show you the, show you the images of a recent article about the experience of a Portuguese woman with endometrial cancer, Lua, that means moon in English, in Portuguese. So Lua agreed to tell her story because I was a woman and a friend, but she decided to remain anonymous. Why? Because she doesn't find an opening or a social opening for a woman's account of a diseased uterus or about vaginal brachytherapy sessions. So responding to her and his, this is illustrated analysis also intends to dismantle stereotypes entrenched in the ways we see women, gynecological malignancies and sexual organs such as vulvas and vaginas. So I'm bringing into discussion a type of cancer that although frequent is absent from public discussion and from our collective imagery. So as a collaborative exercise, the article blends oral narrative, anthropology and creative ethnographic drawing and painting, mixing speech, text and image, grounded, always grounded in the words of Lua Moon. So I understand creative and visual practices as epistemological and performative resources enlarging the way anthropology or social science can understand and act in matters of health and illness. So quickly explaining the images, uh, we can see her three-year-old son and her illness or her cancer cell, and they emerge as two opposite elements in her story since they, since this story conveys the notion of resistance through motherhood, using this bond against the forms of violence engendered by cancer and its treatment, that it's represented in the second diptych where we can see her vagina or the flexibility and color of the tubular entrance of the vagina going through vulva and vagina. And then the tip or the top of the head of the vaginal uh, brachytherapy applicator facing us. Because we have to know and see these realities to know what we face as women while facing this type of disease, uh, an endometrial cancer. So uh, the brachytherapy applicator emerges their most violent and oppressive memory and I wanted to give shape uh, to this image so that we collectively can understand what this type of problem is. So this can make a, like a summary of my recent work and what I tried to accomplish by mixing the visual resources of art with social science. Thank you, Susanna. Um, 
Taking from Susanna's intervention, I would like to ask uh, the same question to uh, Steph, who has been doing research in the past uh, few years, specifically in the direction of practice-based uh, research, leading to some of her own comics work, uh, but also to, uh, to a great deal about practice-based research in general. Uh, and does the fact of being an interdisciplinary and sometimes transdisciplinary field of knowledge facilitates practice-based uh, research? Right. Thank you so much for the invitation, first of all. Um, I'm going to share my screen as well. Um, you spoke ahead of time about the fact that we are divided into different things. So basically, I'll just share my screen for a couple of slides for this answer, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, one sec. Okay. So uh, I can, can you see the image? Sorry. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, okay, so um, I should also say that my background is in fact in fine arts. Um, my own background is an illustrator and a maker of comics, as well as my interest in a reader as a reader of uh, graphic medicine. And my work with the Pathographics Project in Berlin are the three main things that led me to uh, first learn about practice-based research and then to do subsequent uh, research of my own onto it. Um, I've always made comics loosely based on autobiographical events, which I then convert into fiction and fantastic stories. Whoops, let me just, uh, this is some of the covers of some of the previous comics I've done that are not illness narratives, just uh, comics. And um, over the course of this, what I realized is that making graphic narratives involves drafting and sketching phases where the finished drawings are less crucial than how the artist arrives at that stage, namely how the decisions are made about characters, background, sequence, or activity, as well as the choice of medium, the spacing, the pages, et cetera, um, which give body to these unknowable things. So in my research, um, I mean, one of the things I came across reading into ethnography was um, the obvious um, discovery that researchers, uh, some researchers still believe that research itself, academic research, can be neutral and impersonal and objective. Uh, there are many people who would contest this, myself included, um, acknowledging that this isn't in fact tenable, that the researcher is an intersubjective participant in their studies, just as much as the artist stands in relation to their work. And this is done through the editing of their writing, the selected readings, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's inevitable that you're going to have a personal fingerprint on all of your research. So um, over the course of my four years at Pathographics, um, I've made two specific comics that are illness narratives. Um, and this, and what basically the idea was um, to analyze and also corresponding papers on, on the subject. And the idea was to analyze the drafts and developmental stages. So this is the first comic, it's called The Quickening. So there's the final comic. And uh, these are some of the drafts. And so basically I wanted to examine how the imagery changed over the course of the story's development um, in order to result in a comprehensible narrative and what was gained and lost both thematically and aesthetically over the process of the comics development. And the second narrative is called Sisyphus. Um, it was a series of drawings initially, uh, sequential drawings, initially inspired by the idea of retelling and reiterating the myth of Sisyphus from a sort of feminist standpoint, uh, but focusing on the perspective of the rock. And the rock, um, this also was sort of an obtuse ref referral to mental illness because uh, the theme of the drawings might seem a bit unrelated to mental illness, but uh, I also work very much with metaphor and the rock as a metaphor seemed to be really appropriate for mental illness, uh, being a stable and indestructible entity, but at the same time heavy, burdensome and not portraying any vis visible practical use or merit, which to me reflects a general state experienced in mental illness. So the decision to do this also opened up an important possibility that by using the rock as a central figure, I could move away from the excessive subjectivity of autobiography while at the same time looking into a personal story. Um, and so basically in this case as well, I went from preliminary drawings and brainstorming into the drafting stage, an analysis of the drafting stage, and then an analysis of the, um, of the final comic. And yeah, that's a basic, whoops, that's a basic, um, yeah, that's basically my work. Sorry. Thank you, Steph. 
Um, Asunta, uh, can we also uh, hear from you on this subject specifically? And I, I would like to do the, this kind of challenge to uh, for you to speak uh, specifically concerning uh, the development of your uh, of an autobiographical comic uh, about uh, your mother's uh, diagnosis with Asperger syndrome and the writing of your dissertation in applied literary studies on the research of autism spectrum disorder. Yes, thank you um, as well for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Um, Unlike Susanna and Steph, I uh, don't come from a fine arts background. I, um, I studied comparative literature um, in my bachelor's. And um, I've always uh, drawn on the side though and made small comics, but um, always just a few panels. So my project now for my thesis is the first time um, that I'm, I'm doing something long like this. Um, and uh, the structure is, um, it's to, for me, for several reasons, I broke up the structure to make um, several smaller vignettes. So kind of scenes that um, each scene kind of explores an aspect of my relationship with my mom and um, with her, uh, and about her diagnosis with Asperger's syndrome. Um, and I'll just, I'll share my screen as well. Um, sorry, one second. Is this working? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and I'll just make it full screen. Um, so for me, I, I actually, before um, I started with my master's thesis, I didn't even know about the field of graphic medicine. Um, and uh, I started out simply with the idea that I wanted to make a comic about um, my mother's diagnosis with Asperger's syndrome and how that factored into our relationship. And um, that was, I think, a large part of uh, my motivation for that was um, because uh, I did not see her experience um, as a middle-aged mother receiving a diagnosis uh, at 50 years old, um, as a mother of five children. Um, I didn't see that reflected in, in um, popular culture, I guess. And I also didn't see my own experience reflected as um, her daughter and um, the way that I was trying to make sense of our relationship with uh, with this um, diagnosis in mind. And, um, and uh, I was lucky that this, the pathographics project is situated at my university and that um, Professor uh, um, Ermela Krüger-Fürhoff and Dr. Nina Schmidt became my supervisors. Um, and uh, doing doing uh, this, this mixture of a theoretical uh, and a practical uh, practice-based thesis has been um, a bit challenging uh, sometimes because um, it's two very different modes of working. But what I've really uh, gained from it is uh, that through the theoretical part um, and in which I, in one chapter, I look at portrayals of autism, uh, different portrayals of autism uh, in culture throughout time, and also it's changing medical conceptual conceptualizations, um, and uh, and they help me to understand why at first, when my mom was diagnosed with Asperger syndrome, uh, I couldn't really connect her with a condition, and it took me. A few years um, to begin to understand the many layers that were involved in that, and so I'm just showing one of these little vignettes, and then other, uh, or throughout the talk, I'll show other ones. But um, uh, here you can see um, the. This is kind of my small scene about my mom's diagnosis when I learned about it. Um, 
uh, it's in German, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's not in English. Um, but uh, basically, in this first panel, I'm, um, uh, I learn about her diagnosis. My stepfather um, told me on the phone, I, because I was living in, in Toronto at the time. Um, and uh, I was very skeptical. Um, and even though I knew about Asperger's syndrome, because my youngest brother had been diagnosed when he was, was a child, I just couldn't connect what I knew about it with my mom and how I knew her. So I, I thought maybe I just don't know enough. So here you see me going to Wikipedia to uh, check up on what I know. And, um, and uh, then I spoke with my mom about how it felt for her, uh, the, the diagnosis. And she, I was very surprised because she was, she was oh, yeah. elated. Sorry? somebody cut in. Um, she was elated about this diagnosis and um, is telling me that she's uh, relieved. Um, and she says that throughout her life, she, whenever things are going well, she's seeing this in this panel, um, there always came a point when she was, she says in German, thrown out of the curve. Um, so this, that you say that when, when, um, um, things are kind of not going, not going well. And um, so here I tried, I've since when, I, when she said that to me, I always had this image of her in mind being thrown out of the curve and being in a kind of free fall. And so this is how I, I drew um, this, the way that I imagined her kind of um, feeling for 50 years until she finally received this diagnosis where here in this panel, she, um, she talks about how she always thought she should have uh, tried harder and that others can um, manage to do these things as well. But now with this diagnosis, she knows it's not her fault and that the way that she is, that's okay. And this is something that in my research, um, in my theoretical part, I look at different uh, comics that um, deal with, with autism spectrum disorder. And this is something that comes up um, also in, in uh, literature and films, this feeling of, of guilt um, and the, this feeling of being relieved when you get a diagnosis and understanding that um, it's not your fault. So, yeah. Um, this is one example of what I'm doing. Um, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Asunta. From your uh, your three interventions, uh, uh, I think it is plausible to state that uh, you all seem to assume a somewhat natural transition between different fields of, of knowledge. And however, despite these similarities, uh, the use of words and the option or choice of not using words is one of the things that seems to differentiate your, your uh, artworks. Uh, in Asunta's case, for instance, coming from the field of literary uh, studies, um, what is the impact of words in the relation between comics and mental health that you explore, particularly concerning autism spectrum uh, disorder? Um, I'll, I'll just share my screen again. <laughs> uh. All right. Um, so, well, I mean, for, for me, uh, personally, I, what I like, um, what really draws me to comics is the combination of words and images mirror more closely, uh, how I think and feel rather than just language. Um, and I've also made some smaller comics about, um, about uh, 
mental illness that are autobiographical. And um, I think because that experience, even though it's a mental illness, it's also physical. Maybe that's why sometimes uh, words kind of, they are lacking and, and um, it's, uh, I sometimes have just a strong image in my head rather than um, the language to describe to myself how I feel. And um, with this comic, when I started out, um, I really, I used a lot of text because um, I think I didn't maybe trust my images enough to speak for themselves. Um, and I also was explaining, I noticed I was explaining a lot about Asperger syndrome and autism, which um, I think because for my theoretical um, part, I was reading a lot about it and learning a lot about it and that reflected in the comic. Um, I think it's here, yes. So here, this is, uh, this is a vignette that I made um, in the beginning when I started with this. And um, on this page, there's not so much. This page is about um, me moving out from home in high school and um, kind of reflecting on this new situation of being on my own and the responsibilities like cleaning up, cooking for myself, um, but also the pleasures um, like staying up all night and having friends over and being alone when I want to be um, and how that differed from living at home with five younger or four younger siblings um, and with my mother being very controlled in some ways um, about how things had to go. Uh, so for example, we weren't allowed to do anything in the household because we wouldn't do it the way that she wanted it to, to be done. Um, so if I put in the dishes in the dishwasher, my, my mom would you know watch me and once I was done, she would reorganize everything. And she also um, vacuum cleaned several times a day and turned music on very loudly, um, which, which I really um, hated. It was always very loud also with all my siblings. And so one big uh, benefit of moving out was the, the quiet, which is in this panel um, kind of symbolized. And, um, and then here on this page, you can see I didn't finish it because I, um, there's a lot of text and I go into some of the symptoms of, of Asperger's syndrome. And um, I noticed later on that I, I really did, I don't want to make a comic about Asperger's syndrome per se. I don't want it to be pedagogical. Um, I, my focus is on my relationship with my mother who happens to have Asperger's syndrome and understanding how that factors into everything. And it's one aspect of, of many. Um, so I kind of moved away from, from using so much text or I tried to. I'll just show you uh, another panel, another vignette. Um, Uh, so here, I this is um, a sequence that shows me and my mother getting older and um, slipping away from each other or me slipping away from her until we are separated, um, until I'm laying on the ground by myself. And um, this was, uh, this is based on a conversation that I had with her a few years ago, where she said that she felt like this with her children, that as we got older, we kind of slipped away from her. And I tried different, um, I had different drafts of, of uh, sh showing this conversation, but I didn't, um, I didn't like any of them. And it, I ended up with this wordless sequence that is kind of a representation of this feeling of, of slipping away. And it's a feeling that I 
uh, share with her. I mean, I feel felt like that as well. Um, and I realized later that this is actually, I think, at the heart of, of this comic that I'm trying to make, this feeling of slipping away and then moving back towards each other. Um, so, um, and I just wanted to say also, kind of relating back to the first question, I think what um, really excites me about graphic medicine and about about doing this kind of hybrid research like Susanna said is that uh, they bring together um, different kinds of knowledges um, and specialized knowledge as well as experiential and all of these knowledges are valued um, equally and they also have kind of a pragmatic purpose and um, in I think with comics being a hybrid medium of words and images, I think you can, that also applies, you can bring kind of different experiences together through the words and through the images. Um, yes. <laughs> thank you, Asunta. Uh, not only this is a, thank you for sharing with us your, your, your work, not only this is a personal, uh, subject it is also a work in progress and it can give it can give us uh, some clues uh, about the options you made and you are uh, at the moment making um, about your your work uh, Steph I would ask you I want to ask you precisely the opposite uh, uh, does an image is worth a thousand uh, words yeah so Okay, so I should explain that most, as I mentioned, oh, I'll, actually, I'll share my screen as well. Um, I should mention that I do comics, well, I already mentioned before that I do comics without any text. And um, I guess some of this comes from my background studying medical illustration. Well, okay, I studied medical illustration. And so um, I just wanted to say before I turn to the issue of text that um, the idea of illustration is creating images to guide us through this complexity of information that is the human body and uh, and basically assimilating, assimilating all of that into basically a visual summary of some aspect of physiology, pathology, or sometimes even mental state. So with regards to text, however, um, actually I'll go back to the, whoops, oh, just go back to that comic. Um, there's a couple of things. Um, I'm really enchanted by this idea of allowing characters to return to this sort of time before language is what I like to call it. It's like there's this point in childhood before the complications of linguistics that we use as adults um, to try to share our experiences um, start to take over. And uh, that moment in childhood where nothing is formally defined and everything is fascinating. And I think there's a lot of merit in trying to return to that frame of mind and to leave these preconceptions that we've inadvertently concretized through language at the door and to try again to experience what is actually in front of us with images. Um, an art of seeing which I feel can galvanize a rich understanding in reading visual narratives. Um, I also believe that the individual mark of the artist, so drawing style and line, or the, draw, the drawer, the draftsman, um, has an often untapped capacity for emotional communication, which I think is as strong as, if not stronger than words. Um, and for me, creating wordless comics has, um, which starts as, a, which is a directly, like a pr uniquely private and creative experience, but hopefully allows readers to project new interpretations and generate multiple meanings onto the imagery presented. Um, what's also been super interesting to me about making wordless comics to date is that um, the less words there are in a story, the more weight they tend to have. And this isn't evident in this comic. Unfortunately, I didn't include my other comics, although, yeah, I guess. Anyway, um, is that so um, we tend to look we as readers look for words we look for words in books and we tend to use them as signposts through a narrative and so when there are very few of them to go on we tend to pay particular attention to them um, so there are, in a lot of my comics specifically the ones um, that you see the covers of here there are usually single words um, and 90 percent of the time they end up working as double entendres in the narrative uh, so for example the alteration 
um, is a story about a girl who goes into a, a tailor's and um, to make a dress. And basically the alteration is the alteration of this dress, but it's also a sort of an alteration of her thoughts about femininity and her thoughts about being female and so on and so forth. Um, and The One Night Stands was a book that I did that basically was a series of people sleeping that I found on the internet. And uh, I practiced the the drawings were one night stands. Namely, I found these pictures of strangers and I spent one night on each drawing and then I threw the drawings away, so to speak. And um, the idea was there's a sort of the one night stands as a, as a, as a phenomenon of this sort of casual encounter um, of intimacy while well, sexuality is sexual intimacy as opposed to the casual encounter with a different kind of intimacy, which is the intimacy of drawing. And so, uh, that's the third thing. And then the last thing is that I really do feel that wordless comics break down the boundaries of language in a kind of multicultural sense. Um, they make them potentially accessible to a wider readership. And by that, I, I'm acknowledging there's a lot of limitations in terms of what we're familiar with culturally. Like I am very white, white, like I'm a middle class, I guess, well, whatever, normal working class uh, white background. And so obviously the things that I experience visually are, are not necessarily the experiences of a lot of other cultures. But as human beings, I think we have, we, we do share a certain degree of thing with or I just food we eat, et cetera, et cetera. There is a certain universal symbology that comes out of images. And uh, I like the idea of playing with that um, to allow people to create stories for themselves. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. <laughs> Susanna, um, can we say that your, your artwork is somewhere in the middle in the sense that uh, the use of words and the use of images only uh, 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 are uh, kind of uh, used in your visual and graphic representations of illness, disability and uh, pain? Um, particularly in your uh, latest uh, works. Uh, but uh, my question uh, is, uh, can we still call it reading? Uh, well, are you listening to me? Well, what is to read, uh, to look or to touch at words or symbols and to understand what they mean? Well, you can read a musical score and yet you are not reading words, but musical notes. So one of our many languages, you can describe an image with words and you can transform words into images. I would say they are something you can read, see and feel. You don't really need to use words to tell a story. You can use a sequence of images or a series of objects, although they can have a title. They can have subtitles. They can have summaries or synopses or dozens. Sometimes it happens of written pages explaining their meaning. Uh, our childhood books, like I said, uh, are made of images. We read images before we learn to know or, or how to write and read words. And I would say that words are made of lines, but so are drawings. So answering your question and making uh, like a kind of retrospective, I'll bring some images of my PhD, so it was published in 2015. But to show you our uh, sequence, of, a sequence of images or uh, about a series of objects can even change your words, the way you write as a researcher, and the way you think. Um, so I analyzed back then more or less 100 art pages. So these are not my images. These are images of the artists, women artists with cancer experiences that I analyzed between 2006 to 2012, more or less. Um, they include all types of cancer diseases in any organ or body part. And uh, I was looking at this sequence of images and I was thinking, what kind of stories can you tell by focusing on a series of objects, the material culture of cancer? How can they change our words? So what can you know about cancer by looking at the uses and meanings given by these women artists to these objects? So I could say that diagnosing and treating cancer requires the use of objects, but that would be a truism. 
uh, when I'm saying that from the waiting room chairs to medical reports, the first experiences of cancer as a lived reality, what you feel and think, not a tumoral mess, but what you feel and think, emerge with these objects. Fear, anxiety, sadness, anger, but also resilience, courage, hope, um, a sense of unfolding, healing. So regarding surgical instruments, let's move on. They remove malignant masses, but they create pain nausea, discomfort, scars, transformation, but also partial freedom from malignancy. Sorry, I think I, okay. In chemo and radiation, infusion pumps, catheters, or linear accelerates create nausea, vomia, alopecia, tiredness, burned skin. In hospitalization, personal luggage or offers from visitors reduce loneliness, keeping affections and people close to the bed even when visiting hours are over. What about regarding death? Well, I would underline the patina these women leave behind in their clothes, beds and other personal belongings in the form of smell, sweat or fallen air strands. But I also emphasize the memories and stories that remain attached to these things, extending the existence of these women in a multiple material format that can be felt by others, by bereaved and loved ones. So what can we read in these projects? We can read, see and say that objects are modular components of our cancer experiences, inseparable from our bodies. And to understand this connection that exists between objects, bodies and cancer, I coined back then in 2012 a concept I called, and sorry, because my English sometimes is not very good, the third half of things and of knowledge. So normally we understand things like something that can be divided into two halves. What I'm saying is that there is a third half that unites everything and everyone, the place where everything merges and nothing is separable, completing each other, since while objects create our experiences, we give them use and meaning completing them. So where's the difference between me and objects or between art projects? Aren't they, aren't they a part of the way I live, understand and act on disease? So this is a word and concept that can assemble what is separated by our eyes and old words, a new ontology, an epistemology, a new way of defining and knowing the world. So as my final answer, if these things can be read, you can see our sequence of images focusing on a series of objects on the stories they tell can even change our words, the way we write and the way we think. So that would be my answer. What a brilliant answer, Susanna. Thank you. Uh, the third issue I would like to, to discuss and of course, th these issues are, are all related uh, in a way, despite of, uh, of our uh, sequence. Uh, and uh, one of the issues I would like to discuss with you is the idea of technology uh, behind it. Uh, I, I will start with Steph. Uh, being generally portrayed as a result of an interaction between the medium of comics and the discourse of healthcare, um, graphic medicine is also a community of um, academics, healthcare, authors, artists, uh, and of course, readers in all possible uh, senses. Uh, but the choice of this specific uh, medium of comics has, of course, a series of reasons, starting with, I believe, uh, the unique way in which it enables the writer or artist to translate other people's emotions and we can talk of grief or pain but many many others uh in your case uh steph um i know you're all also a curator in exhibitions of medical comics uh for instance uh, sick held at uh, berlin museum of medical history in 2018 and taking into account the transposition of comics uh, from the usual two uh, dimensions into other spaces, namely into exhibition rooms, how do you pour or galleries? How do you portray the relation of this specific medium of comics with other media? Yeah, yeah. So 
so yeah, as mentioned in 2018, uh, I was the co-curator and designer of an international exhibition on comics. And I'm super excited because I think one of the audience members is one of the artists who was involved, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not sure. Uh, Anna Montero, I see her name, but not. So anyway, maybe say hello in the chat if it is you, Anna. Um, her comic is in the top row there. Anyway, um, so yeah, um, this comic, so this, whoops, sorry. Ah, uh, wait, where am I? Sorry, here we go. Um, yeah, so the exhibition was um, a, a collaboration with the Pathographics Project, or organized rather, um, by the Pathographics Project. And uh, the, the Pathographics team worked together on the curation of it, and we had an international uh, call for comics, as it were. And we, ended up we chose 11 comics based from artists all over the world australia israel canada germany portugal uh us china and the uk and um these comics were um about any number of different illnesses from pulmonary disease to infertility to um a grandparents illness and the need for care uh burnout a more sort of social social mental illness uh, dementia the epigenetics of mental illness and Crohn's disease. And um, we, this, uh, this is a picture. So this is a picture of the exhibition. Actually, what I'll show you first is, this is where the exhibition took place uh, at the Berlin Medical History Museum. And uh, we chose the venue on purpose because of the juxtaposition of the reality of the spe medical specimens and the human made creations that were the comics. Um, provided an interesting contrast between the reality experienced by doctors when dealing with illness and the realities experienced by the patients dealing with that illness. And um, so basically what we had was, uh, this is the Virchow collection of pathology specimens. And uh, in between all of the shelves there, we had the comic uh, comics printed out and we uh, focused on particular aspects um, and we sort of did these fisheye view um, of specific aspects of the comics to sort of explain how different aspects of the medium were used to tell the narrative. Um, and yeah, and that's that. And sorry, because the question earlier did also have to do with technology. I, what I'll do, I'll put it in the chat, but um, because there are a lot of, um, I'm sort of looking into that as well. And um, I will show one, actually, I will show one other slide. This is unrelated, but this is an earlier uh, uh, comic installation that I did years ago um, relative to a comic. It was called Playing Doctor. And basically, I, maybe it's not familiar to audiences here, but in the US and Canada, there is a game called Operation, which involves a, a figure which uh, you operate on by using tweezers to pull out the organs. And so basically at the time I made a life-size version of this operation game and um, we had a public event where people got to play operation using the kitchen tongs and, uh, and every organ sort of had a corresponding description. And I just wanted to show this as sort of evidence of some of the different ways in which medicine and images and texts can come together to sort of reevaluate the experience of illness and the experience in this case of surgery. But, um, but and I won't mention it, but I will put in the chat just a few links to some other people who are doing interactive comics that are web-based as well as animation um, that I think are just super, but um, I prepared the link, so I'll just put them in the chat. And yeah, that's me. Yeah, thanks, Stephia. We can use the chat and uh, we will also have uh, 10 minutes after our conversation so that people can uh, also interact with us and uh, make some comments or suggestions and uh, that can be an opportunity to share other artists uh, works. Um, relating to this uh, thematic, Asunta, I know that you also have a close uh, relationship to media arts, including the use of new media arts installations in your creative works in the last few years. Now, I was wondering, and I'm not sure if you directly explored these uh, technologies, but I, I will just ask it uh, anyway. Uh, what are your feelings about uh, platforms such as uh, virtual reality or 
augmented reality platforms, for instance, as a potential technology and the exploring of mental health uh, issues uh, through comics. And I, I'm thinking here in the possibility, possibilities, such as playing with the idea of depth uh, through 3D, but also the idea of avatars, uh, etc. Um, yeah, I, the work I've done um, in installation and, and film and video, um, I, it's always been in collaboration and my part has been uh, text-based so and then also i i work with uh, radio and and so there it's sound and text um so i as you've maybe noticed with sharing my screen i'm actually pretty bad with computer related things <laughs> and i have no experience with uh, these technologies and i haven't really thought about it because um for me i what I what really draws me to making comics and also to reading them is the simplicity that to make them you you really just need pencil and, and paper. Um, and and I really like the, the tactile experience of, of it of drawing. Um, and to read it, it's uh, I think that one reason why comics um, are so so good for telling very personal stories is that you um, have this concept of closure that Scott McLeod uh, talks about so that um, you have in the panels kind of frozen moments in time that then the re that require an active reader to to um, fill in the space in the gutter and to kind of infuse these panels with um, movement and time and um, and I think with new technologies um it can often get very gimmicky when they are just used for the sake of using new technology um uh, when it's kind of for aesthetics and and not for a further purpose but also i really i'm not um i'm not i, I haven't seen anything that um so i i'm not talking from experience but i do think that um kind of a more broader idea of expanded comics um, can be really fruitful. And um, I saw at actually a, a workshop from the Pathographics project that I think Steph also co-organized. Um, I think it was last year in November. I saw um, a presentation on a project um, from uh, the University Hospital in Jena and uh, they developed a comic in collaboration with um, an illustrator to help children that are in the children's ward and that are going to have surgery um, with pre-surgical anxiety. Um, so they, this was, I think, a really long research project that stretched over several years where first they asked um, doctors and patients and parents um, about all about the experience of having surgery um, for kids, I think between two and 10 or something like that. And, uh, and then based on all that they were finding, because they were finding that um, this pre-surgical anxiety was um, really having a big impact on the healing process after with sometimes long lasting effects. And um, so then they developed this, this comic, um, in German, it's super duper affen geniales Narkose comic, which translates to uh, super duper monkey uh, genius um, uh, anesthetic comic, <laughs> I think, and or anesthesia comic. And they developed this this monkey as kind of a um, a mascot. I think his name is Manchu, and he leads through this entire process of going into surgery from the moment you arrive at the hospital to really going to the to the surgical room and then what happens in the surgical room while you're under anesthesia and so on and um and this was given to the kids and the parents when they first came to the hospital and then they i think printed stickers of this of manchu the 
the, the monkey and put them up in the space um, as the kids were going into, into the surgical room. And I think they even, I don't know if they really did this or if they were planning to do this, but I think they wanted to uh, also produce um, like a stuffed Manchu animal that the kids could have after the surgery. Um, and then they, they evaluated if this was having an impact on, on this um, anxiety and it was, it was helping both the children and the parents and of course, if the children are calmer, the par uh, if the parents are calmer, the children are calmer as well. So I think that's a really interesting example of um, of kind of expanding comics and bringing it, using it on page, but also off page, and putting it into a space. Um, and it's very, but with a pr very pragmatic purpose. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, taking from this notion of, of expanded um, comics, uh, I was uh, thinking, uh, Susanna, uh, I see your, your artistic work, uh, most of your artistic work, uh, conveying here a slightly different meaning of graphic medicine, since you deal mostly with uh, graphic representations of cancer, uh, translating, or better yet, uh, transducing into a different code, expressions, emotions, uh, expressed by patients. Um, uh, as such, this is not a situation of scientific illustration, of course, despite Susanna's work in this particular uh, field, uh, as it is not our uh, therapy, uh, on the contrary. Um, and the translator or conveyor is the one who masters the technique in this case. Um, and balancing it with aesthetic uh, sensibility, uh, so that expressions, emotions maintain their original impetus, so to speak. Uh, Susanna, is that right? Or can you tell us more about the ways in which all of these practices differentiate from each other? Well, trying to disrupt your question. <laughs> well, uh, I'm, I'm turning now to my own work again, to my own illustrations. And it is, it is a form of a scientific illustration, at least in my case, a creative scientific illustration. Um, so I'll present the visual results of my postdoctoral monograph. It was published last year, as you said, in 2019, Cancer on Paper. So every epistemology needs a methodology. So putting in practice that strange word I said lately, um, or the concept, the third half of things and of knowledge, where all forms of reasoning merge and cannot be separated, this research and this monograph combines embodied knowledge, oral narrative, anthropological reasoning, and art, reinventing social science, scientific illustration, and ethnographic drawing, enhancing it with metaphor and imagination. But how, uh, how, do, image, how do images come to be? Uh, what kind of process is behind it? Do I master anything? So this book re retells the stories of eight Portuguese women from my own relational circle, so family and friends, each book chapter and image is co-authored, since I understand them as co-creations, although written or drawn by my hands, their conception was made possible by these women's stories and words. So I'm here ambitioning what, what Boaventura Sousa Santos would call cognitive justice in authorship. So I recorded our informal conversations with each of these women, a woman. So using their metaphors and the events they consider relevant from their point of view. And I gave form to texts and images using extensive selections of their speech in the written articles. So I'm using their own words and the metaphors they give me, their embodied knowledge so that I can create these images, but everything comes from them. So. The first two stories, and women, um, redefine understandings of wholeness and disability, focusing on, on what remains unchanged. So this, a woman with one amputated arm, that tells us that only biomedicine was incapable, unable to diagnose or treat her cancer or a phantom limb, while her, Olinda, my mother, can complete the same tasks she had before the sarcoma and the amputation. She just needs more time. She's all and able, complete in a different way. Sandra, uh, with a metastatic melanoma, working until her very last weeks, 
So defining the ideas of a weakening body. So she died like a tree, standing. The next three stories and women clarify our process of ontological growth or shrinkage can affect the way cancer is perceived, uh, perceived altering its impact. So Raquel, a personal stylist, so you can see how I used, you know, the metaphors from her own profession, that transformed thyroid, thyroid cancer into a small event, an accessory, by focusing on a plan of personal and professional growth. Inversely, Maria, a retired woman, completely undone by a small breast recurrence. Why? Because she was already retired and she felt that she had already lost all that she could be, do and have, feeling diminished and isolated inside her home. Alexandra, a breast cancer survivor and carrier of BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations that challenges simplistic views about suffering, minimizing pain, stating that the worst part is waiting, waiting, waiting for diagnosis, waiting for treatments, waiting for reconstruction, and worst, waiting for a possible recurrence. The next two stories dismantle any understanding of cancer as an individual occurrence, describing it as a shared event beyond body divisions or separation. So Sylvia and the story of a couple with the double experience of cancer, her, a breast cancer, and him, a lymphoma, for whom both illnesses were lived as intermingled react realities, shaping each other's experiences and memories, so defying the idea of a separation between bodies, between organs, between illnesses. And Candida, Maria Candida, and the story is told by her daughter, uh, Maria João, so it was a woman with a nasopharyngeal metastatic carcinoma, but the story that reveals that dying and death are a shared family event, that resistance is a cooperative process. So all the family, all the sozas, all the family members experienced cancer and death, but also created her resistance together. And finally, the story of a woman that died 30 years ago, Violeta, leaving behind the 13-year-old daughter, Flor, now above her 45, she's over 45 years old. So the only thing that remains was an empty 70s dress and fragmented memories because many were lost and several others were intentionally forgotten. What, she's, what she tells us is that to survive, to resist, to survive cancer sometimes implies silencing cancer, forgetting the story and deleting the past. So what I would say that my researches point, my research projects point to another ontology or the outline of another ontology, epistemology, and I need really a new methodology, that third half where, where people, experiences, objects and different forms of knowledge are parts of an undivided and indivisible sum. So far from conventional social science, this illustrated monograph aims to challenge our collective imagery and understandings about oh. so seeking to foster a supportive context for patients and for families. So that was my intention as a woman, as a researcher, as a daughter, since I brought my own mother to this research. And with that same intention, my PhD and my postdoctoral monographs also utilize a simplified creative language without scientific jargon, aiming to democratize science, to making accessible to all, to all readers, to all viewers. So again, turning to that idea of words and images, to something that you can read, but something that you can also see and feel. You can see and feel the cancer or the cancer diseases of these women, or the way they live these experiences. Thank you, Susanna. I'm sorry for the, these interruptions. Uh, I tried to maintain this session the most uh, uh, democratic in the end, uh, but it's it's difficult. People uh, enter and uh, sometimes we forgot to disconnect our, our microphones. Um, we as we approach the end of this uh, very uh, productive uh, conversation, I would like to address uh, one last question to all three uh, in no particular uh, order, uh, especially because one of the things I 
took from seeing uh, your works and presentations is the way in which they connect to each other through some crucial issues uh, from my point of view. And I'm thinking here of the idea uh, of uh, feminism, but uh, namely in terms of body uh, representation. So uh, can you explain us, and uh, you can of course show us practical uh, examples, uh, how these different narratives that you depict through your creativity use the aesthetics of their medium to embrace these and other themes of extreme relevance for a given, uh, for a community. And we can, we can extend it to the ways in which these graphic orthographies help patients to learn more about their condition, disability, etc. but also in order to diminish the impact of misconceptions about a specific disease or uh, treatment in uh, communities. I, I don't know, Susanna, do you want to, to continue and then we follow uh, with uh, Steph and Asunta? Is that okay for you? Okay, I'll have to share my screen again, so sorry. <laughs> Well, although all my work focuses on women's standpoints and situated knowledge, uh, well, my master dissertation published back in 2009 is the work that I think that most strongly clarifies all our works of art about cancer can carry a feminist and activist agenda, what women can achieve as individuals and as a collective. So. It resulted from the online analysis of an international list of 24 artistic projects created by or with professional and amateur women artists with breast cancer. So what does the embodied knowledge of breast cancer patients teach us? And what can their artistic narratives accomplish? What can really these women teach us? So they teach us that art storytelling helps to control and give meaning to illness. It gives a color and a shape to cancer, pulling it from under the skin, making, making it visible, tangible, interchangeable, creating experiences for others on viewers. So regarding photography, it exposes realities normally hidden behind hospital doors, wigs, clothes, and prosthetic bras. So it dismantles stereotypes, enlarging what we understand as normal, inserting mastectomized, bald, asymmetric, and scarred female bodies in the public space and in collective imagery. At the hospital, art blends with embodied and medical forms of knowledge. And while biomedicine looks at body parts and details, art contextualizes, so it looks back at the hospital showing that medical spaces, objects, agents and substances are also constitutive parts of our illnesses. When it reaches the street, normally as group exhibitions, our art becomes activism, transforming individual goals and stories into collective agendas, ambitioning to unveil cancer social, political, economic and environmental causes informing and demanding change, mobilizing viewers, mobilizing us. So for terminal cancer patients, and Kirsty was a friend of mine, she died while I was finishing my master dissertation. So I remember her as one of the most cherished moments of my research. Uh, well, art is, is an exercise against physical disappearance, against social shrinkage, photographs, drawings, sculptures, carry these women's faces, gestures, and narratives. Artworks are their ontological extensions beyond body and flesh. I would say that these women are still here in a different format. And concluding, we can speak again about art's ontological, epistemological, and performative character. So art is not a representation or a reproduction of reality. So art is a constitutive part of experience itself, a form of knowledge and a transformative action, immersed on the way female patients live, understand and cope with breast cancer, from resistance to death and beyond, between individual expression and collective activism and literally changing the world. So that would be my answer. Steph? Want to add? Yep. Um, okay. Uh, actually, yep, I'll share my screen as well, just so you can see the comics. 
so I'm going back to the same two comics because um, I think they illustrate well what I'm talking about. So with regards to body presentation, uh, I find myself time and again returning to human-based anatomical subject matter, partially because of my training. But I've also had a really deep love and fascination for the beauty and complexity of the human body forever. <laughs> uh, neonatal drawings also seem to come up time and again in my artworks, which is really ironic given a lifelong complete lack of interest in having children myself um but so with regard so that's um body presentation specifically um a little more leaning towards feminism um as i mentioned before um i tend to use single word titles or single word in my comics a lot uh, specifically in the titles as well which turns each comic for me into a kind of narrative redefinition of a specially chosen word and so with regards to the quickening, uh, which is the final title of this comic, um, it refers to the stage in a pregnancy when the first movements of the fetus become palpable. So it's a sort of, it's not used very often anymore, uh, but this is what it means. And when the fetus first shows signs of life that may be felt by the mother. So even though the term is not used anymore, it once um, referred specifically to that stage after conception where a mother could announce her pregnancy or choose to keep it secret. Because before the invention of x-rays, the mother would be the first to know definitively that she was pregnant when the fetus began to stir inside her womb. And this would not be something that was visually apparent to those around her. So this definition appealed to me as something vaguely subversive, not just for the status of empowerment that it lent to the, to the female, to the mother, but also for the associated secrecy, which resonates with the stigmatized nature of mental illness, the subject of this comic, um, the secret that no one wants to reveal about themselves, and the secret that, if neglected, can grow up and unwittingly eclipse its owner's freedom. Um, and the other one is, uh, whoops, sorry, just one second. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and the, yeah, this comic Sisyphus um, was very much um, can, one of the things that came up for me a lot was the sort of um, the pathologizing of pregnancy. <coughs> so actually, when I did my master's of science on uh, in 2012, it was on midwifery in the 1800s in the UK. Um, so I learned everything there was to learn about um, childbirth. And specifically that midwifery was the domain of men and remains so for a very long time. Uh, so I was on purpose that there's a very graphic illustration in this comic of childbirth with the doctor's, a male doctor's hands prying the woman's legs open. And then the subsequent image of her lying with the umbilical cord still exiting the body, which um, are specifically meant to showcase the vulnerability of women in the medical context of childbirth. And so, um, the issue of pathologizing the body of women's vulnerability, specifically women's vulnerability, but I mean everyone's vulnerability in the surgical theater, et cetera. Um, those are things that come up repeatedly in, yeah, when, uh, with regards to my work. And that's me. And we will end with Asunta. All right, I'll also share my screen. Um, um, okay, um, so with autism spectrum disorder, um, I mean, my thesis is called uh, Drawing Out the Invisible Difference. So um, autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder where um, you can't, you know, there's no bodily symptom in that way, but um, it becomes, or the symptoms uh, become visible in a social context, um, in social interactions or most visible. And um, so with kind of, depicting my mom and um, trying to show her experience in some way, although I also feel that, um, I mean, my objective is to, to focus on our relationship and I don't feel that I, I'm, um, I have license to, to, 
tell her own experience and to to show her life but in the way that it factors into our relationship and in the way that i show her um i really as i said in the beginning one of my reasons for doing this is that i didn't really see her experience reflected and this is also something that i found um in the in the research that uh for example the the link between autism and gender um has it has not been studied very much and it only started to be looked into in the past few years and um for a long time there was this idea that um autism was a, a male uh phenomenon and that women didn't wouldn't really didn't really have it and now um research is showing that this is not the case and that uh, in women um they just often fall through the uh, through the cracks when it comes to diagnosis and um they show some different symptoms um from the ones that are laid out in diagnostic manuals um and from the ones that are present in in males and um so for me i want to want to show um in my comic um my mom interacting within our the context of our family so um here the, these panels are a bit um messy but um on this page here um just and this comes up throughout the comic um just kind of m my mom uh in the context of the family at this point undiagnosed um and um how some of what i can what i now think are some of the ways that she coped with um some of her um asperger symptoms so for example this constant um uh, vacuum cleaning or her um kind of control issue with how things were cleaned and so on um i think that now i after understanding um autism better i think that this these were ways for her to deal with with the chaos around her um and these were things uh the sound and the motion of the vacuum cleaner and the music that she it was always the same music always the same two bands that she would play with that um were ways to control her environment and to also um in those moments of feeling overwhelmed with a lot of sensory input um kind of um closing herself off to this and and calming herself in that way and but i think that neither her nor us we realized this um and um uh yeah i i uh i go we i show some of our conversations where um she talks about her past and um and also um i touch on some co-occurring conditions like anxiety depression um eating disorder um that often um come with with autism spectrum disorder but um um i think that with with autism nowadays there's such a hetero heterogeneity sorry problems with this word in um in the landscape in uh, so with even within the autism um community there's debate over how autism should be framed and represented um therapeutic measures all of this is kind of up for debate and um autism spectrum disorder has been conceptual conceptualized formally um now for seven years um at least in the um dsm and um still representations tend to be limited and i think one way of countering that is to um to kind of accumulate a wide variety of examples of life with autism um on the spectrum so really in all its in all the nuances that exist because there is not one experience 
with autism, there is not one, um, uh, there's not one way that this presents. And um, so I think any, any subjective contribution to this will help to expand this, this image of, um, of the figure of the autistic. Uh, Asunta, one of the participants uh, uh, asked you if, uh, uh, what were the two bands your mom played while vacuuming? <laughs> uh, Eminem, <laughs> guess he's not a band, and uh, a German hip hop band called Die Fantastischen Vier. So I guess hip hop and rap, <laughs> very aggressive. <laughs> Well, as we fastly approach the end of our second session of online conversations, uh, an initiative promoted within the scope of the postgraduate program in creative research, arts, health and technology at the University Fernando Pessoa in Porto. I would like to thank once more to our three uh, special, very special guests, Susanna, Steph and uh, Asunta. I believe we have uh, a few minutes to um, for, for questions and comments. Um, people can ask their questions here on Zoom, uh, but uh, they can also use the YouTube uh, channel of the University of Fernando Pessoa uh, if they prefer to. So I would open the discussion to everybody. I think we have a question here in the, one of the comment commentaries. Um, let me see. Okay, one of the questions by Anna Gagu is, since you mentioned the combination of other media and technologies combined with comics, if we could still consider the final result as a comic, which leads to the second part of the question, I don't know if there's a, maybe there's a first part of the question above, that would be, what is the specifications or moreover, the advantages of comics and it's bi-dimensional experience. I know that Asunta has already uh, talked a bit about it, about this, but I would like to hear from the other participants too. Thank you. Should I start or do you, do you want to? Yeah, go ahead, Steph. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, yeah, also, Anna had had another question beforehand, which is the first one is how graphic medicine practices is related and differs from art therapy. So I'm going to address that as well as her question, because um, I think that it actually isn't different from art therapy. I think that uh, I don't know a lot about art therapy, but I do know that they are very, very dedicated to using practices of drawing, specifically also dance, et cetera, um, as a way to allow patients to, um, to, to manifest their experience of illness. So basically, I mean, it's a graphic, it's a medical humanities, uh, definitely, I think they're related. Um, with regards to your other question as to um, the combination of other media and technologies, is it still a comic? It's a really good question. Um, two of the links that I sent earlier that are in that actual file, because for some reason they wouldn't paste, um, actually, let me just see if I can paste them again. These, I think it really depends on what your definition, ah, yes, yes, and now it works, okay. Your definition of what comics are. These two specific links are, would definitely uh, count as comics to my mind, but they use interactive elements. So the top one is an interactive comic of a young woman with an eating disorder, and you click on the panel. So according to you know, Scott McCloud's definition of comics with panels and closure and the use of um, in between space, et cetera, et cetera, but with the added interaction of being able to click on them and decide, it's almost like a choose your own adventure. And um, one of the things that's absolutely super about the second one, uh, These Memories Won't Last, which is um, uh, autobiographical by Stuart Campbell, who talks about his grandfather's childhood memories, which are disappearing because he has dementia. One of the things you notice um, at the top, as, as you scroll down the comic, the rest of it disappears. And this is an absolutely poignant way to illustrate the actual, the lived experience of dementia as you see these panels of the comic that slowly disappear as you scroll down and read the story. And so I think in some sense, we might have to expand our definition of what comics are to include this new interactive element. Uh, 
I would argue probably that the installation event that I showed was would not strictly be called a comic. It was related to a comic. And I thought it was a fun way to sort of show how images and, and there's sort of this endless capacity for images and text to be um, reevaluated uh, or put together to illustrate illness. And I think Susanna can probably speak more to that with her artworks. Well, I would start by the first question. Well, in my 15 years of work as a researcher, I never used the term graphic medicine or therapy. Uh, I understand that my work can be embedded in the concept of graphic medicine, but I always understood these images created by other artists or my own work as uh, constitutive parts of experience or as extensions of experience. So I never used that term. About therapy, I believe that art therapy is like a package normally sold by hospitals or by therapists. So, even though I understand that art can be used by all these artists to build meaning and uh, trying to control the events around them, I never understood it as therapy. I never used the word because I believe that this is like a kind of package that, can, that you can sell at, a, at a clinical facilities. About the other question, about the idea that if you, if you mix other things with comics, and I can say uh, with drawing or even with science, I could, I could ask this question about science. If I'm like embedding other things inside science, drawings, painting, photography, metaphor, imagination. And I've heard this before my PhD defense, like Susanna, you are not doing science. Oh, isn't it a, a valid form of knowledge, something that you can apply, that it's valid, that you do with and for society? Since I'm doing this with and for these women, isn't this a form of knowledge that counts as science? So we can always say this, if you join and mix something and assemble more things, we are not destroying anything. We're just assembling, we are uh, creating that third half where you can mix everything and nothing is separable. So I would say this. Uh, Steph, you, there's another question for you uh, in the comments, yep. uh, mm -hmm. the chat. Yep. Uh, so yeah, the question being, uh, for those who might not have read it, um, that I mentioned using different materials for different medical diseases and what experience can I share about how I decided on materials and stylistic choices? Um, to be honest, I can't remember what I mentioned with regards to different materials for different medical diseases. Um, but I mean, perhaps different media, definitely. I mean, I've used different media. I've also in the past done three, I did an artist residency in San Francisco where I did 3D work as well. Um, and each media sort of offers its own um, capacity to sort of expand the narrative, I guess. But um, yeah, but, but, I have to confess, I'm I'm trained as an so I my background is in fine arts. Initially, I was a painter, but uh, I have worked as a professional as an illustrator, a medical illustrator, and an editorial illustrator illustrator for many years. And so um, I'm in love with pencil drawing. Um, recently, in the last couple of years, I've gone into ballpoint pen drawing. But um, I have to say that I'm that I'm a little bit uh, I've got a little bit of blinders on just because I love the ta the, the tactile sensation of that. And so. Um, most of my comics have been in uh, watercolor pencil, although I did with, as you saw with the quickening, I did, I've been sort of, I've interested into moving into digital, I've been playing with it, I'm not convinced that it's something I want to continue, but I enjoy the experimental quality of it and I enjoy it helps me to simplify things because a lot of my drawings, maybe because I'm a medical illustrator, tend to be very, very detailed and very uh, strained sometimes. And so I've been, in terms of trying to simplify, I've used, um, I've moved into some digital drawing to try to break down shapes. And also because I'm interested, I love a wide variety of comic artists, you know, like Chris Ware, who just do, they've made comic into a, an art of its own that's just this strange. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, but I think I, I don't know that I necessarily make a conscious decision relative to the subject matter I work on. I definitely have a preference for pencil and watercolor and uh, I occasionally branch out into new things, but I'm a little more traditional that way. Uh, I think Pat Pat Patricia is asking uh, 
uh, as one question. Uh, hi, Patricia. How, how are hi. You? Uh, Welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, and thank you very, very much. Since I, I'm using my voice, <laughs> let me thank everyone for the uh, extremely interesting and riveting, really, uh, presentations you made um, for sharing this with us. First of all, to all of you, all of you, uh, I, I had a question which was a bit of a provocation for Susanna, who I know and were colleagues in the same research center. And uh, Susanna, uh, I and uh, um, Diogo have um, collaborated um, in a, um, a summer school that was uh, intended to rethink using creative um, methodologies. Uh, in social sciences and humanities. So this is sort of a, a conti continuity of a conversation we have been having and will certainly, I'm sure, continue to have. Uh, but my, my provocation question, provocation, Susanna, was the following. I take your point, uh, what you say about art therapy uh, being um, sold as a, a a package, your critique of it as being sold as a package. But uh, knowing your work, knowing also knowing your work, uh, I know that you've worked uh, also with artistic creations by uh, women who have suffered uh, different kinds of cancers. I'm referring now to your master's work of, that went that resulted in your master's uh, thesis book. Um, but in, in particular, in those instances, uh, artistic expression can be a form uh, of therapy for the uh, cancer sufferers, for the patients. Uh, so it can be a way of them finding balance, control, as you mentioned. Uh, so my question was, um, how do you take that into account in, in, in working with with uh, that, uh, with with those those works, in analyzing those works, uh, and also then that leads me to the other question, um, side B of the question. Uh, then in your further work in translating uh, and co-creating uh, with pa with patients um, uh, with, of different illnesses, um, how um, how do you find that working with them, your feedback? that you have from them during the uh, the process and afterwards how do you feel that uh, uh, the the work the, ex the ability to express themselves artistically in collaboration with you has empowered them w what is your feedback and what can you tell us about that process briefly thank you very much well about the the first two lists of international women artists that uh, have gone through the experience of breast cancer or uh, all types of cancer diseases. I only work uh, uh, in anything related to therapy if the artist tells me that it was therapy. As an anthropologist, I use the words and the concepts that people give me. So I would say that in my master dissertation, Susan Shatter, I would say that is the only artist, and maybe Ollie Siegler, that, that used art as a, as a mode of therapy. And like I said, if it controls what you're going through, if it builds meaning, this could be understood as therapy. But if they give me that word in their projects, in those summaries and signups, and sometimes dozens of pages to explain their work, then I'll use that word. And I'll explore how was it a therapy for them. Regarding my own work and my eight women over my, the eight women from my own relational circle, um, I would say that if, if there is a therapeutic moment is when I give them back the articles or the chapters and the images so they can read and go through everything and ask me for possible changes or to say if anything is wrong or misunderstood. And on those moments when they wrote back or when they sent me videos showing their the effects of reading the, the article and seeing the images, I would say that it's closure to see that their stories are told and closed, you know, inside this chapter, this chapter inside those four, five, or seven images. So the, the story has been told. The experience is, is, you know, behind your back. I would feel that it's closure. But one of them sent me, Alexandra, because she still carries the BRAC1 and two mutations, and she sent me a video where she had finished to read the chapter and she was crying, you know, like we say in Portuguese, you know. 
um, she was crying and, and she said, thank you, thank you. You know, the universe has conspired to bring me close to you so you could do this for me. But like her story is never closed. So uh, what's the therapeutic thing here? I think it was our connection, you know, to build something together. And maybe that's worse therapeutic. And for me, and I, I really don't like to use the word, but I would say that it was therapeutic for me because since my mother lost her left arm back in 2003, my intention with all of this was to be a better daughter, a better woman, a better researcher, and to somehow create her a left arm. All the things I have created, you know, these texts, these books, these articles, these images are like a left arm because it's, it works better than a prosthetic. She never used a prosthetic because it doesn't work. You know, it's an arm prosthetic. So I think that it was therapeutic for me in that sense. And if I give them something bad, if, if, if it has some effects, positive effects or transformative effects in the lives of these eight women and they've been at you know the book launches and they smiled with me and they were co-authors so they were there as authors so I think it had a positive effect and you could say it was therapeutic yes Patricia thank you so much for your question thank you we still have time for one more question uh, Rebecca Pardo uh, hi Hi, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much because this has been really, really interesting. And just before the conversation, I just opened one box because I, I'm putting my back my, all my books. And this is was what what's, was in the in the box. So I was so surprised when you just put this in the in the slides. So um, thank you very much. And I was thinking about the last question and was what Susanna was talking about science and uh, um, I think and I would like to know your opinion that the science has been too much scientific and I think that most of people with an illness a grief or a death had the need of express themselves to communicate a different illness narrative from um, the medical uh, scientific um, um, narrative. And so I think that uh, graphic medicine, photography and art, I don't know if they are therapeutic or not. They have a, a side of therapeutic. But what I have been founding in all my research is the need to communicate and the need to elaborate um, a narrative with somebody else. I don't know if you have the same impression as I have, or do you have another thought about that? Thank you very much. Maybe Asunta, do you want to answer? Sure. Um... Yeah, I think, I mean, I think what I've really found um, extremely gratifying about graphic medicine um, and uh, in conferences and in papers I've read is um, how it really seems to bring together um, people who, um, who have experience or it brings together these different um, Knowledges, like I said before, and uh, what Mark Austin calls empathetic scholarship. I think that's a really nice term, um, which kind of encapsulates the idea that um, that personal experience and kind of serious academic work they don't need to cancel each other out. And same with sciences and and art, that um, if you can bring these together, you can really create community. And I think that's what has been really outstanding to me with graphic medicine, that um, uh, all the conferences I've, I've been to, there's really this great sense of community and this, um, this communal effort to take difficult experiences and very 
singular experiences because often illness and disability experiences are very can are very um, can can be alienating can really be something that um, makes you feel very lonely and trying to um, somehow make something out of that through sharing and it can feel I think for people that are affected um, Dorothy Marx also coined this term the affected scholar so um, people who have disabilities or illnesses um, that they can also bring really that very important knowledge that is often missing from very theoretical work um, to it to make it richer and um, to um, make something that feels like it's taking away from your life maybe um, turn it into something that um, can empower you and that can just connect you with others and move away from loneliness maybe. Uh, can I mention just yeah, yeah. really quickly? Yeah. I have to apologize. I was momentarily distracted from another question from another viewer. So hopefully it's not off base, but um, following up on what Asunta said, uh, the graphic medicine people, uh, I'll have to find the link and send it after the fact, but when the COVID pandemic struck, they immediately set up a series of drawing sessions where they got together online and they did sort of a Sunday afternoon session. And the drawing sessions were meant not for artists, they were meant for everybody. And they were meant for academic and because the community, and I have been going to the conferences, the graphic medicine conferences for eight years and the community is fantastic. And they're just, they're so open and they're open to sort of breaking down these boundaries between academia, medicine, science, and art. And in such an active and supportive way, there's no judgment, you know, with regards to people's lack of scientific knowledge or uh, artistic ability. There's this implicit idea that everyone has something to contribute to a larger narrative. And so, um, yeah, I just wanted to mention that. I think, I think they're actually still going on and they are open to anybody. And uh, if I can find the details, I'll send them. Definitely the, the, the visiting fellow uh, of our pathographics project, Susan Squire, is involved in them and, uh, and told me about it. But, um, but it's, I've never seen something more illustrative of how graphic medicine has brought together people from different disciplines uh, uniting to kind of tell the narratives of our time, um, specifically with regards to health, illness, <laughs> global pandemic. <laughs> Uh, Susanna, would you like to? Well, just uh, uh, one little thing. When when the the eight women that I invited to my postdoctoral project said yes, well, they really wanted to communicate. So they wanted their stories out. They wanted to share knowledge. You know, create change. Regarding you know to be less scientific, although all of us use imagination and emotions and sensations, we just don't admit it. We have always used them in all types of sciences. But my research center, SESH, um, defies us to do that, you know? They invite us to make those kind of mixes between different forms of knowledge. So I had this opportunity, not in my master, but entering my PhD and my postdoc to have the courage to do it, you know? To bring democratic language into my PhD or creative language to bring uh, creative drawing, pho pho photograph, but to bring something that breaks all the rules of ethical science, to bring my own family, my friends, my colleagues, my acquaintances into research and to understand that it's, I think it's best when, when someone wants to, wants to give you their stories, it's worse to reject them. Oh, it's not ethical. I can't interview you. It, this is worse than to really use that knowledge to change your own science, the way it works, and to change society. So that would be my answer. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you very much for your questions. And uh, well, we're reaching the end of our second session uh, of these online conversations. And I would like to thank once more to our three very special guests and for mm -hmm. their wonderful uh, presentations. Okay. Uh, Susanna, Steph, thank you. 
Asunta, uh, and for sharing with us their knowledge and expertise in this in this uh, thematic. Uh, I would also like to thank you all directly present here in this uh, session or watching us on a YouTube uh, channel, as I would also like to express briefly express my gratitude to our colleagues in the university at uh, the laboratory, the TV laboratory of the University of Fernando Pessoa, and also the Communication and Image uh, department, department for enabling uh, these live stream sessions. Uh, well, um, I would also um, like to end this webinar by announcing uh, that next Tuesday, July 28, we will have a very uh, special last session dedicated to uh, the public uh, launch of a second volume of uh, the Cyber Textuality series, a collection of books edited by Rui Torres and published by uh, the University Fernando Pessoa Press. Uh, this volume is titled uh, Research, Experimentation and Creation in, in Art, Science and Technology. And uh, uh, it has the participation of national and international creative researchers such as Manuel Portela, Cristina Sá, Pedro Barbosa, Pedro Veiga, Rui Torres, and many, uh, many uh, more. We count on your presence. Until then, stay safe, stay uh, healthy, and stay creative as well. Thank you very much.